It's good to worship the Lord together, isn't it? Choir, you sounded amazing this morning. I love that song, one of my favorites, with voices singing. Because right now, I enjoy the music so much. When I get to heaven, I'm going to be part of the choir. We lift our voices in song together to praise the Lord. We gather together with our lives to surrender them to the Lord. As we go to God's word this morning, let's pray together. Father, we, we gather here once again. We gather, Father, here in person and those that are joining us electronically through net connections. We, we come collectively together before your throne of grace. And we ask that you will speak to us from the sacred pages of scriptures, from the stories written there, from the messages that we will read this morning that they might, might touch our lives in such a way, Father, that we will be moved into a closer relationship with you. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. We live in a time of message saturation. Do you know what that means? Maximum saturation is like pouring water in a sponge. It can only hold so much, and you can keep pouring, but no more is going to go into that sponge. Oftentimes you receive 40 or 50 emails a day, a dozen pieces of regular mail that you retrieve from the mailbox and keep one or two, and the rest goes into the round circular file without being read. The text messages, they come all day long, countless. If that's not enough, just turn the tube on, or as now it's called the flat screen. 24 by 7, some messages. The news cycle is about 72 hours long. The bad news or good news lasts about a day and a half or two days. And if you miss it on one of the news stations, you can turn it on the other one. Who got it there first? Who has the most extreme view? In about a minute and a half, you can catch up on the buzz of the day. Message, saturation. Do you ever feel that? I do at times. It's like just... Turn it off, please. But yet we go back to the clicker. We go back to the little pinging thing in our pocket. And if we remove more than 20 minutes, we wonder how we survived that long. How in the world is God ever going to break through that message, saturation? But God has, down through the stream of time, and continues to do it through his messengers. I'll just recall a few in brief outline. Uh, Joseph, Job, Joshua, Jonah, the reluctant messenger of God, didn't want to go where God wanted him to go. Where did he end up? in the belly of a fish. Didn't smell very well in there, did it? When he was released, didn't want to go, reluctantly. Then he complained to God about people not responding to his message. Daniel, the demoniacs in the Gospels, recaptured from evil, went out to be the first missionaries and those who were there complained about the swine that were cast over the cliff. Elijah, John the Baptist, Martin Luther, Ellen White, Billy Graham, HMS Richards, George Vandeman. And we can go down through the stream and call out each of your names as messengers of God. God needs you to be 
His messenger today. If you forget everything else from this message today, that's the sound bite, the take home. God needs you desperately to be his messenger today. You see, the messenger is the one who carries the message on behalf of the one who gives the message. If you are wanting to get a message from Washington, D.C. to the very furthest points west in a generation that some of you have seen, it would take and have to go through 15 or 20 hands. And it would go by Pony, what do they call it? Pony Express. Some of you laugh. You've read about it in history books. Some of you are actually of the generation that it was still in existence. A message, handwritten, perhaps, or if you were fortunate to have a typewriter, you would type it out, and it would go from person to person to person to person. And in blazing time of several days, it would make it to the distant points out west. We live in an interesting day, don't we? It no longer takes days or weeks. Express mail today, priority mail can get it there, what do they call it? Over, overnight, 24 hours. Amazon can put it on your doorstep the next day. Amazon Prime. Oh, you smile, you know what I'm talking about. Why well, go down to the hard, hard bricks and mortar store? I'll save the gas and time. And yep, there it is, right on the doorstep, as planned and paid for. It's a great world we live in. No longer do messages take days and weeks. It's now measured by hours or days or, wait a minute, minutes or, wait a minute, seconds. It was impossible in the days when I was born. And I'll have you bear in mind, it hasn't been that long. In my generation, it was impossible to get a message to everybody around the world in any timely fashion. Today, it's a few texts on an email that goes viral. For the first time in history, it is possible for God's message to go around the world in, speed, in real time and in speeds which we have never had the capability of before. An amazing day that we're living in. And the last days will be rapid ones. But God still needs His messengers. And He's depending upon you and me. And when I say you and me, I mean you and me. Not you and the person sitting next to you on your left. And the person sitting next to you on your right. We live in the last hours of earth's history. And he's depending on us to be his messengers. We live in a, a fascinating time just to set the framework in getting this message out. George Barna, a church, uh, a church pollster who was well-renowned, has done a survey of contacting 62,000 plus people and the question of the poll of that survey was, have you been to church in the last six months? Pretty low threshold, isn't it? Excluding baptisms and weddings and formal occasions. Have you simply worshipped with a community of believers in the last six months? This Christian nation was polled from coast to coast in a broad survey. The good news is, there's plenty of work to do. The bad news is, this Christian nation by behavior 
is largely detaching from Christianity in their behavioral aspects. Why do I say that? With that metric, have you been in church in the last six months? 39 plus percent, 40 percent of the population in North America is considered unchurched, as he uses the term by definition. That's bad news. That's good news. Because the people you talk to, you have a good chance of reaching with the gospel because they're not hearing it from anyone else. 40% of the greater Santa Clarita community would be 80,000 people to be reached by the gospel. And it will take this congregation mobilized to reach them because they won't likely be here this week or next week. In fact, they probably have no intention of going unless somebody comes into their life and personally forms a relationship with them and draws them in in a loving way. Isn't that the way it worked in your life, friend? Isn't that the way it works? Taking the gospel and the good news to others. The numbers don't look good. But as we commit our hearts and lives to the Lord, He works in amazing ways. We serve a God who continues to bless His people as they reach out in ways as, as His messengers to carry His good news to others. I'd invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 18 because we will review in outline form what the messenger must do and be about and how the messenger, how the message gets shaped to reach the listener. Paul went forward the last half of the book of Acts is really centered around the life of Paul, who was originally known as Saul. And after his conversion experience, he was Jewish background, as after his conversion experience, the uh, angel of the Lord appeared to him, and he gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. His eyes were open to the gospel. And I'd like to pick up the story, Acts chapter 18, verse 4. And he, Paul, was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade who? The Jews and the Greeks. The first thing I believe that if we're going to be messengers for our Lord Jesus Christ is we must use a little bit of reasoning. Does that make sense? The simple fact that you believe it means nothing to other people. Did you catch that? There are a hundred different beliefs out there. There are some people that already believe. There are some people that believe a little bit. There are some believe, people that believe, think all faiths are the same. And you have to start reasoning with them. What does that look like? Reasoning with them means we listen to them first. Huh. How are you ever going to tell them and convince them if you listen to them first? How do you know how to reason with them if you don't know how they're reasoning? How do you know how reasonable they are? Where is their background? Are they just converted to Christianity? Have they grown up in a home that Christ is a new word for them? Are they open to having a dialogue about spiritual things at all? And he was reasoning where? In the synagogue, every Sabbath, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. By this time, he's a Christian. And where is he going? To Christian gatherings? Well, we believe that Jews were worshiping God, but he was going 
back to his heritage and listening and reasoning with them and telling them of the things that he learned. I believe there's something here that as Christians we must embrace going back to our heritage, the homes that we were raised in, going back to the cultural pieces that we were raised in, taking Christ to them and reasoning with them from their framework of understanding. But when Silas and Timothy, in verse 5, came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. If we are going to be effective reasoners and have strong reasoning, I believe that we must devote ourselves to the Word. Do you believe that, friends? It's not enough to listen on Sabbath morning and say, yeah, I heard a couple of interesting things. Some of it was new, not so much, a lot of it. But we must be daily in His Word, completely committed to reading His Word. The very best way is to take a passage of Scripture, a book of the Bible, a chapter of the Bible, and read it day after day after day after day until you can tell the complete story almost by memory. Committed to reading His Word. The average person today spends five to seven hours glued to electronic something. Five to seven hours. I can already hear you saying, where would I find a half hour to read the Bible? Hmm. The third time that you've heard it on the news, isn't that enough? You know that little button on that remote? There's that little button. It says power. It, there really isn't much power in it. You turn it on so readily. Give it another click. Leave it off for a day if you can go through that length of time in withdrawals. You'll find you'll have five hours a day if you're like the average person. What happens if your internet goes down? Do you go into withdrawal? The next day is all right to respond to something. If it's an emergency, they'll contact somebody else to contact you. Give it a break. He continued devoting himself completely to the Word so that he would have a word in due season. The reason, the reason that many messengers are afraid to be messengers is they don't have a message. Ouch! Ouch! Solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. The word in the heart of Paul caused him to realize that Christ was to be Lord of his life. And he had something good that he had to tell others. He had a word of testimony. He was testifying. Is there a word of testifying here today? Or is it something that that's the preacher's job? Wait a minute. You have a word of testifying to give in the workplace, to give in the family. If it's nothing more than God has been good and gracious to me, and let me tell you why I feel that way. And coming from you, they will appreciate it. Coming from preachers, they think it's preaching and part of the preacher's job. Am I telling the truth? How is it? When a colleague at work is telling you about the blessings of God, your ears warm up, your heart gets warm, and you think there is another Christian I can talk to. What happens if you are that person who is proactively reaching out to them simply to share Jesus and what He has done to you? You see, you can't testify in a court, unless it's first-hand experience. Everything else is second-hand and not allowed. The reason oftentimes that Christians are shy of testifying is because they have a lot of second-hand information, which if you have nothing else to tell, is good stuff to share. It's your fallback plan. Did you catch that? It'll catch up with you Tuesday. 
the Word driven into our heart knowing Jesus and testifying of him. Now the assurance is there in verse, um, verse 9 and 10. The Lord said to Paul in a night, uh, by night in a vision, I like this part. How many of you are a little, uh, a little shy of testifying to somebody? Stranger, how many of you are? Raise your hand. It's okay, really. It's okay. I'm shy. There are times that I just assume, just be me and enjoy my quietness even in the group. It's okay. But for those who are really, really shy and have fear that you'll say the wrong thing, the Lord said to Paul, don't worry about it. Do not be afraid any, what does it say? Any longer. That implies that he was afraid at least for a while up to that time. And God is telling him, do not be afraid any longer. Go forward, Paul. Now you have to realize, he had reason to be afraid. He had reason to be afraid. Because they would take converted Christians out and beat them. He had reason to be afraid. Because he was at the stoning of Stephen. He held the garments as they stoned the Christian to death while he was a Jew thinking he was doing the right thing. He knew the cost of what it might mean to be persecuted and lose his life. Thank God we live in a country that we have religious freedom yet. But we better make haste while we still have that freedom. There are people in your community, in this community, that we need to be proactively reaching. In the same verse, go on speaking, he says, to his messenger. Go on speaking and do not be silent. And verse 10 says, here's the reason why, because I am with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you. There's only one reason to go forth as a messenger, and that's to carry the message. The messenger is not the message. The messenger does not make the message up. The messenger simply carries the message forward. That's good news, isn't it? I don't take it personally when somebody says, oh yeah, I've heard that all before, and I'm not interested. I don't take that personally. I say, Lord, let me keep, keep working gently on that person's heart. Let the Spirit of God prevail. So if, if you are shy and afraid, go on speaking. Don't be silent because God is with you and you will not be harmed. Verse 12 says, uh, they brought, uh, they brought Paul, um, they brought Gallio, uh, who was proconsul of Archaea, um, and the Jews rose up in accord and brought uh, Paul before him. And the ruler that, uh, the Jews, uh, said, He's causing trouble. And the proconsul raised his hands and said, this is a matter of names, labels, and you guys figure it out among yourselves. I'm not going to be troubled with that. Isn't it nice to know that God can even work through uh, people who are not professing to be Christians? In times of need, in times God just sends His Spirit, we have a country of religious freedom. We must make the most of it while we have time to do so. Paul, in verse 18, again, 18, uh, verse 19, he came to Ephesus and he left them there. Now he, he himself entered in a synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews. Once again, reasoning, telling them that Jesus is the Messiah that they think is coming forward. Verse 21, but taking leave of them, saying, I will return to you again if God wills. And he set sail for Ephesus. Verse 24 says that he, when he came to Ephesus, he was mighty in Scripture. Once again, a man of the word. In verse 25, Apollos, uh, Apollos, said this, Apollos was this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. Do you like that description? Sometimes you walk into a person's presence and they are so filled with the Word of God. They have been so deep in the Word of God. 
Their life is just in harmony, in synergy with the way of God. You just know you're in the presence of somebody who loves God. Have you experienced that? I like to hang out with those kinds of people, don't you? I don't like to hang out with pushy people. Know-it-all people. People that want to tell me exactly how I should think. For somehow I'm wired that way. About the fifth time that somebody tells me something, I usually say, I got that the second time. Thank you for indulging me this morning. You're a sharp group. You got all of this stuff the first time I said it. I only say it a second time for myself. But he was in the way of the Lord, the Bible says of Apollos, mighty in Scripture and fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus. He only got one thing wrong. Here's a man who's walking in the way of the Lord. He's fervent. He's zealous. We use the term, he was on fire for the Lord. And let's hang out and see how long it is that he can be fervent in the Lord. It's time that this church starts to testify. Do you believe it? It's time that this church catches a spark. It's time that this church allows the Holy Spirit to warm our hearts up gradually. That our hearts get so warm that they catch on fire. That we can't contain the blessings of God. And things will change in our congregation and in our community. Do you believe it, friends? But it isn't going to happen unless you and I are messengers for God. For you see, Apollos had it all right, but he didn't quite have the baptism piece all figured out. But Jesus worked patiently with him. So what is it, friends? How is it in your life? Are you a messenger that's been sitting on the bench? Are you the messenger that's saying, at the right time, if somebody comes and asks me, I'll tell them? Are you the messenger that says, I don't know enough yet? Are you the messenger that I've got to have it all figured out? Are you the messenger that says, when somebody asks, I'll call the preacher, and that's all right, I'll go with you. Call me anytime. I love to meet new people. You invite me to your friend's house to tell them about Jesus, and I'll do it ever so gently. I'll make you proud. You invite me. I like to meet new friends. We'll go together. Are you the person that says, in the right time, I'll do it? I think Paul's approach was he was proactive. He went to the hard places. He went to the Jews. He went into the difficult spots. He was a man of the Word. He was walking in the way. The God of Paul the God of the book of Acts is alive and well today, friends. How is it working in your life? Will you be his messenger? I want to share with you for two minutes. Paul, um, we don't have time to go through Romans chapter 1, but I would challenge you to read at least the first half because there, we, there you find in fullness an outline what Paul considered to be the good news that he was taking to the Jews. And he reasoned with them and said, This is Jesus, the Son of God, with power, the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you are called of Jesus Christ. Do you have good news today, friends? Do you have good news? Are you a messenger that can carry the news of Jesus crucified? Because we have hope in our hearts. Because we have love. Because we have forgiveness. We have assurance. We have fullness. We have a way of walking. We have a lot to offer. Others who have no hope, who have no assurance, 
who don't know the way, who haven't experienced forgiveness and know not where to turn. The good news is God has a plan. The good news is that plan is you. His plan A is that you will be his messenger. He has no plan B. Let us pray. Father, you sent the gift of your only begotten Son to be the fullest and holiest messenger from your throne of grace. He died on the cross that we might have forgiveness of sin and reconciliation to you. Father, by your Spirit, you have moved men's hearts in times past. But Father, we in the quietness of this place of worship are walking in your way. And we have the full realization, Father, that you are calling and inviting us to be your messengers. So Father, fill us with your word. Fill us with your message. Give us hearts that are not afraid. Help us to step forward. Father, to share that forgiveness, that comfort, that hope with others, Father, that Jesus might be lifted up and glorified. Father, help us. Help us to be your messengers in the fullest sense that we might bring the fullness of honor and glory to you and to each person that we come in contact with. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.